Hello, and welcome to the Duke Cardiology Conference. I'm Sunil Rao, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Duke University Medical Center. Today's program is titled Hemodynamic Support for High-Risk PCI, and my distinguished guest is a good friend and mentor, Magnus Oman, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Program for Advanced Coronary Disease at Duke. Magnus, thanks for joining us. Great. It's great to be here, Sunil. Magnus, we're doing a series of programs centered around uh, a single patient because a patient will come into contact with multiple specialists during the course of a hospitalization. And the patient under consideration for today's discussion is a 75-year-old female who presents to the hospital uh, in borderline cardiogenic shock. Uh, she, has, she rules in for an acute MI and then undergoes cardiac catheterization the next day and is found to have multivessel uh, coronary disease. She's deemed too high risk for bypass surgery. And the question, uh, I guess, for our discussion today is, what are the options for a patient like that who has high risk clinical features, potentially some hemodynamic compromise, who has uh, no options for surgical revascularization, but uh, uh, needs to undergo PCI? What can you tell us about that? So, Sunil, this is becoming, as you know, a more and more common feature of what we see, elderly patients, complex disease, not really a surgical candidate and I think this is where the cath lab has really had to step up and actually sort of put in uh, place enhanced technology to really help patients like this and it's the fun thing about it is that we have a lot of these technologies available to us now. Uh, I'm going to go through some of this uh, technology with you to just share with you and the audience a little bit where I think we've been, where we might go and some of the exciting things to go along with this. So when we talk about hemodynamic support in the cath lab, we think about a number of conditions, and you talked about this lady with borderline cardiogenic shock. She would possibly actually fit into several of these here, but she would be at certainly cardiogenic shock potentially, acute mitral regurgitation. There are other conditions, unstable angina, refractory arrhythmia, bridge to cardiac surgery, transplantation. Let's say this patient would have gone, uh, to surgery, he, the surgeons would really love to have a way to support that patient prior to doing surgery or high-risk surgery, and then finally post-operative low cardiac output. But what we're going to talk about today is really about high-risk PCI, what we would do uh, strictly in the cath lab uh, for this setting. When we talk about hemodynamic uh, <coughs> support, and particularly in cardiogenic shock, but this also applies to other situations in the cath lab, patients who do poorly they eventually go down the spiral. This spiral actually was first developed by Jim Bankston, a former Duke Fellow, and Rob Califf, published this paper many, many years ago, and it's now been updated with this beautiful spiral where you have <coughs> myocardial infarction, inflammatory activation, decreased perfusion, you get nitrous oxide synthesis, you get vasodilatation, and the spiral keeps going downwards, decreased cardiac output, less perfusion, and so on, until you uh, get death. The idea with hemodynamic support devices in general, they're there to su actually support the patient, to bring the patient to a sort of a, a equilibrium where you can work on it and sort of reverse the condition that's underlying all of this. Now when we talk about the whole idea of working with surgeons in this, we, we should acknowledge the fact as interventional cardiologists that we haven't been quite fair to them. They're a little bit suspicious of us. And we think about it, we've sent them patients that they had thrombolytic therapy, then we use glycoprotein 2B3 receptor blockers, then clopidogrel, and we say to them, oh, don't worry about this patient, just take care of them. Well, I think that's not really fair on them, and I think communication with CT surgery is really a key to this. Their biggest fear, you should remember, is inability to come off pump. And so whatever we can do in the cath lab, with or without PCI before, is really key for them that they can get the patient off pump. And it's not always predictable. And then finally, they're now tackling harder and harder cases. So they're going to see more of this. And generally speaking, uh, if we can support our surgeons both pre-op, as potentially in a case, or post-op, that's really the goal of this in this setting. The area of uh, LV support has gone back a number of years. Actually, even to the 60s, we had ECMO, uh, which is really a perfusion pump. We had intraoral balloon pump in the 60s. And then from then on, we had uh, CPS in the uh, 80s and 90s. Hemopump, a device that sort of transiently was, was with us and then disappeared. 
tandem heart, which is a more sophisticated way of doing CPS, and then the most recent device is the impeller device. And I'm not going to touch on all of those, but I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of them. So this just uh, gives you the idea of when these were um, uh, approved. I mean, balloon pumping is so old that it actually was grandfathered in even before the regulations that we currently have for FDA approval was actually used in the 1960s. CPS components are approved, used in the 90s, uh, and then tandem heart came along in the uh, late 1990s. Now the components are FDA uh, approved and it's in use. And the impeller device was 510K approved based on a similar type of device and currently in use in this setting. So let's start with a simple device, the balloon pump. It's actually a very commonly used. The advantages with it is easy to use, has very established physiological performance, easy vascular access. We actually put in two today at Duke. Uh, easy bridge to cabbage and elbow. So surgeons like this device. It's easy for them to place um, after surgery. So what are the cons? Well, it doesn't give a whole lot of uh, hemodynamic support. For patients that need some support, it's good, but for more complex patients, not quite as good. It has um, no support in cardiac arrest, and it has limited value in non-shock primary PCI, that's sort of ST elevation MI, and I will talk a little bit about that. You know, I think that would surprise uh, many people in the audience who are watching that you actually get minimal hemodynamic support. I get the sense that there's a little bit of mystique around uh, balloon pumps. I mean, people, I think, um, operators tend to think that they're doing a lot of things that maybe they aren't doing. Um, what are your impressions? I mean, do you think that, uh, we're going to go through the data in a little bit, but do you think that maybe balloon pumps may be overused, or do you think they're not used enough or maybe early enough? Well, I think that it's a highly variable use, we should say. It, there's a couple of interesting features. Uh, first of all, I think it's in some clinical situations underused. Mm -hmm. We don't actually use enough of it, particularly in cardiogenic shock, patients with borderline hemodynamic, because the data, while we don't have much clinical trials, is actually pretty supportive just for observational studies. The, the second piece to this, which I think is fascinating, and there's only been one paper on this, but I think it's very important. This device, just like any other device that we have, both in surgery and in uh, interventional cardiology, requires training. Mm -hmm. And if you don't use a whole lot of it, you're not going to have the experience of when and how to use it optimally. And therefore, your outcomes will not be as good. And this is a paper published now a few years ago by the National Registry of Myocardial Infarction uh, Group. And they just found it has a volume relationship, just like PCI, just like cabbage. And we should just keep that in mind. So it's not an easy answer. Yes, it's overused. No, it's underused. It's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But let's just review a little bit quickly what the balloon pump does. In diastolic, um, during diastole, it is inflate, inflated. The balloon is inflated. And it causes coronary perfusion and some peripheral perfusion, enhanced average blood pressure. In systolic deflation, it reduces the afterload. So it is complex hemodynamics. And... Interestingly enough, although this is not well recognized, if you don't respond to balloon pump hemodynamically, the outcome is very poor. So that's one thing that we don't pay attention to now, now that we have more devices. And we should try to use it as early as possible. I have some data to support that. What are the uh, physiological things? Well, these are old papers. Look at these papers, 1971. That's kind of a few years ago, almost before you were born, Sunil. But it, it's associated with improved uh, cardiac function, Diastolic blood pressure with introduction in systemic acidosis, classical studies. Enhanced coronary perfusion, less infarct-related artery reocclusion with the earlier physiological data. The piece that people tend to forget <clears throat> is this is not so much about shock. This is about blood pressure. This is a classic paper by Maud Kern and his colleagues. They looked at the change in diastolic flow velocity as a consequence of the balloon pumping, with, with balloon pumping, and the relationship to base of systolic blood pressure. And what you can see on this uh, slide here is that if you, blood pressure is less than 100, this is where the balloon pump really performs better. In normal blood pressure, it doesn't add anything. So the answer may be that we should be more careful using it in low perfusion states, be it shock or not shock, mm -hmm. in this setting. So I think that's an important uh, message. We have a lot of experience with balloon pump. I'm not going to go through all the different things. I'm going to highlight a couple of things, namely balloon pump in the U.S. versus other centers, and then the timing of balloon pumping. And this has been uh, covered in two uh, uh, papers in this uh, 
um, from this benchmark registry. This is actually interesting. This is observed versus predictive mortality among all commerce requiring balloon pump in the U.S. versus non-U.S. What you can see, the higher you predict the mortality, um, there is a stepwise increase in mortality as you'd expect. But when you look at the U.S. population across the board, it's always a little bit lower. And that's because we use the balloon pump more proactively compared to our European centers. And in another uh, paper, it's actually uh, described here, if you looked at the preoperative balloon pumping in where it was used in an adjusted model, it was associated with actually quite dramatic outcomes. It's not randomized. But there are two randomized trials that actually suggest this, two small trials that I'm not showing today that actually suggested the same thing. And if you look at when you put it in, actually earlier versus later, looking at later, <coughs> putting in balloon pumps later, is always associated with a higher uh, mortality. So I think, you know, more proactive use, more judicial use will be better. Now for this patient, what we're talking about is really about assisting during PCI. And this, this randomized trial presented last year at TCT by Simon Redwood and colleagues is the first large adequately powered study that had randomized patients to balloon pump versus non-balloon pump. Now I have to say they did this in the UK. We couldn't do this trial here because we have, would have biases, but they did it and they did it well. So they randomized um, patients to elective balloon pump insertion versus no plan IBP in high risk patients, low EF and a high jeopardy score and they left the balloon pump in for about 24 hours and they followed the patient for six months. You can see about 300 patients, low EF, 23% on average, uh, high jeopardy score, you know, quite high average 10, which means that m most segments are involved uh, in uh, this patient having PCI. You can see that for the balloon pump treated patient, it wasn't quite inserted in everybody. There were a couple of patients where they couldn't insert it, and then there were 12% in the no PCI, in no balloon pump group that actually crossed over, and most of those crossed over for hypotension um, and some other uh, things. But you can basically see that it's otherwise a very well randomized trial. The median duration of use uh, was about nine hours for the balloon pump, and where it was no plan, they used it a little bit longer because the patient had complications in this setting. If you look at the primary endpoint of this trial, you can see there was overall no difference with balloon pump versus not. Numerically lower with the balloon pump, but if you looked at mortality, CVA, or MI, or REVASC, there really was no difference. Maybe a little bit surprising finding uh, given what, what we, how we use it today, and this is through 28 days uh, randomization. If you looked at the um, six-month mortality, the basically the numbers are trending in favor. It's not a significant p-value. But if you, and yet if you looked at procedure complication, much less in the balloon pump arm, you remember you had a 12% crossover, so that would be expected. Another very important part, bleeding was not all that different. Uh, if you looked at major bleeding, it's about the same minor bleeds a little bit higher in the uh, prophylactic balloon pump arm, and procedural sex, uh, success was about the same. So uh, a very good trial overall. And this is looking at the long-term mortality. You can see it's interesting if the patients who had uh, elective had l maybe a little bit higher risk originally, but once you cross over, things look a little bit better. But once again, the trial was not powered for mortality. Interesting findings um, in this setting. So I think balloon pump has some value in this setting. The randomized trial did not support it completely, but there's always, you know, it's always hard in trials today when you get some results that are pro, some are not quite as exciting as you want. Now let's turn to another device, CPS, which is, that, uh, is we now call ECMO, really. This is mm -hmm. used as a lot. Now this is two large cannulas uh, 18 and 21 French, 18 in the arterial axis, 21 in the venous that takes blood out of the um, uh, right side of circulation and oxygenates it with a pump and then puts it in the arterial circulation. This device was called in, in the heyday in the 90s, CPS, um, and, but now it's used at the surg surgeons as ECMO, it's very similar thing causing uh, oxygenation of uh, the oxygenated blood. So 
pros with this, cardiopulmonary bypass is well supported. Setup time is relatively short. It takes about 10 minutes to set up. And it's an easy bri bridge to cabbage and elevator. I think that's why the surgeons like it. But it's not without its problem. Vascular access, well, 18 and 21 French. We're talking radial. You like radial, <laughs> but there's no way this is going in radial. This is very big vessels. So uh, that's an issue. The other thing is it requires a specialized team. You really need to have a perfusion team, a lot of people to do this. And importantly, because the blood is taking out of the right atrium, you get no LV venting, which means that some of the blood goes into the LV and the LV can balloon up over time. Short-term use is not an issue. Long-term use, this could be an issue. As I said, I'm not going to talk about this. We don't use it a whole lot anymore. Now, Tandem Heart is an upgrade on CPS or, or ECMO, and I'll show you how in a second. But it builds on CPS, so cardiopulmonary support is well established. It gives very good cardiac output, actually removes blood from the left atrium, so the venting issue that you had with other support is not an issue here. Now, the downside is tr it requires transeptal approach. Most of us are not quite as facile to do acute transeptals. Our electrophysiologists love doing it, so you need to work with an electrophysiologist, but it's not easy. Vascular access here is also not easy because they're equally big cannulas, 21, 18 size. And the bridge now to cabbage and elevator is more complex because now you have a catheter hanging out over the septum, which if you move the patient and so on, could be an issue. So this actually is a diagrammatic <coughs> representation of the um, venous cannula actually sitting in the left atrium through a transeptal approach. And then the blood goes into this pump, it's a, of course oxygenated blood, and then is delivered through another cannula into the um, uh, left femoral artery and the femoral artery. Now, does this work? Well, it's interesting. This is actually a carotid uh, artery flow measurements by Doppler, and it sees when you have just one liter per minute of flow, you get very little background fill. You have the up natural upstrike, upstrokes uh, from car uh, cardiac output, but if you go to 3.4 liters per minute, you can see you have this background buzz, which is a c continuous steady uh, cardiac output. Now, using this device is very effective as far as improvement in cardiac index. This is from Holger Thiele and others in Germany, published now a few years ago, looking at comparing uh, tandem heart with balloon pumping, uh, cardiac index before and after. You can see dramatic increases in cardiac index, d dramatic decreases in uh, venous pressure. As you can imagine, wedge pressure falls because you're taking the blood out of the left atrium and serum lactate goes down. So hemodynamically, it's a wonderful device. It has some problems with it. First of all, limb ischemia with these large cannulas, it is a problem. 33% of patients in this study had limb ischemia and blood transfusion, 90%. So very high uh, sort of complication rate. And of course, in this uh, study of shock, uh, there was no difference in mortality. Now, some centers have really taken to this device and used it a lot, and I think it is a very good device to support high-risk patients, but taking the patient with this device in uh, to the OR and so on is a little bit more uh, complex. Now, let me ask you a few questions about the tandem heart. Um, in general, for a patient who, in whom you're considering it, do you generally do an abdominal aortogram before you uh, embark on that? Yeah, that's a good question. I should have mentioned it earlier. For balloon pumping today, I think it's, you can just go ahead and do it. I mean, there's six and a half French, seven French. They're, they're so small, it's not going to be an issue with the most uh, vascular issues we have. When it comes to CPS or tandem heart or even impeller, we're going to talk in a little bit, you should do a autogram because these devices um, are much larger. You need to know where the straightest axis is. Tortuosity could be as much of a problem, actually, as uh, vascular disease because mm -hmm. you can't just get the catheters in. These are pretty stiff catheters. So, so yes, that should be done. For elective PCI, it should always be done for yeah. these sort of cases. It's, it's a good, good issue. And then uh, you mentioned the different flow rates with the tandem heart. Is that something that you dial up based on some measure of cardiac output that you're, you have a right heart catheter in? Or how do you determine yeah, what the right so, rate is? Yeah, so what you do, so really both for Impella and for tandem heart, you need to be sure because you're almost like putting the patient on airway, you need to be sure you have filling pressures. Mm -hmm. That means fluid in the tank. And so uh, usually we do these with uh, right heart cath. Uh, present so we can measure uh, 
wedge or um, uh, pulmonary diastolic pressure. And you want to be sure that you have a adequate pressure that you can actually fill the ventricle mm -hmm. enough so that they can use the device. The tandem heart will shudder. That is to say, if you don't have enough blood in the left atrium, the device will stop working. So you really have to be sure that you have good filling pressures here and actually fill the patient up. And so most people use it with uh, a right heart can. And the final question is when you remove it, uh, is it uh, pretty routine to get vascular uh, surgery to close these or can you use manual compression? And what's the strategy there? Yeah, so, so there's, there's basically three, three, uh, three major strategies. Uh, there is the um, uh, strategy using per close. So you have two sutures. Now this is not FDA approved for you to use, but you would use two suture kits around the catheter and mm -hmm. use that as your arterial access closure. Can't use that on the venous side, uh, but you can use that on the arterial side to close it. Um, uh, there is uh, going to the OR approach. Mm -hmm. Some people prefer that. It's actually an easy operation for a surgeon yeah. uh, to do, and it's an easy thing. And then, actually, many of us still do the old hand-holding, mm -hmm. and it works. We've had experience here at Duke of doing uh, over um, uh, 40 cases where we've handheld practically all of them mm -hmm. with, with good success. There are problems, though, and they mm -hmm. can bleed, and you need to be prepared for that. But yeah. generally speaking, those three options are all reasonable options. Mm -hmm. okay. So the Impella device, the new kit on the block, so to speak, uh, has just become available about three years ago. Uh, it's an easy-to-use uh, device. It offers good cardiac output. It is a relatively easy vascular access. It is a between a 9 and 12 French uh, uh, cannula, uh, 11 and a half on the cannula, but it is a lot easier than using uh, tandem heart or CPS. It's an easy bridge to cabbage and elbow, as I explained in this uh, uh, second. So are there any cons? Well, it's a relatively new device. I don't think we know all the issues. We, I think most people who've used this device are now pretty careful how they use it, mm -hmm. but I think if you go into more general use in shock patients or things like that, they could be a little bit harder, particularly around the aortic valve, and I'll come back to that. And the problem with this device, it may not offer enough support in full cardiac arrest because it only gives 2.5 liters per minute cardiac output by the, the sheer nature of the size of the cannula. And so if you have a big person, cardiac arrest, 2.5 is not going to cut it. And so, so it's not, in prolonged cardiac arrest, it may not be enough. But overall, the experience to date has been pretty good. So here is actually diagraf diaphragmatic or diagrammatic uh, um, picture of the catheter in place. This is the, the pigtail top catheter. Here's the inflow, the inlet area. The blood goes through this cylinder here. And the pump actually is back here, and the blood is let out here. So it's a mini miniature technology, 12 French pump, placement over the wire, insertion across the aortic valve, pigtail for increased stability. And actually, when you run it at full, uh, full flow, th there's a vacuum in the ventricle stabilizing the device. So mm -hmm. it's actually pretty, uh, pretty clever like that. Yeah. Uh, catheter down at the leg is the 9 French. So less limb ischemia issues, and you have flow modulation up to about 2.5 mm -hmm. liters per minute. Of course, when you put devices across the aortic valve, you have to worry a little bit about it. There's been a number of studies, they're all listed here, you know, from a few patients to over 100 patients, the TE or angio or uh, trans uh, uh, TE, and basically has no, shown no damage to the aortic valve, but that's you know, something that we have to keep in mind. They've need not seen any trauma in the setting. The first evaluation with this was the PROTECT-1 trial. It was a feasibility trial, only 20 patients, um, high-risk PCI uh, completed a few years ago. And what you can see here, the hemodynamic from this study improved quite a bit. End diastolic pressure fell from 18 to 11, stroke volume actually fell a little bit because the pump kicked in, mm -hmm. and you looked at your cardiac output, it went from, in this group, from 6 to 7, of which the pump contributed at 2.5 liters. So you, you can see when pure cardiac arrest, this may not offer exactly the support. This is now being tested in a randomized trial, uh, one-to-one -one randomization, PCI plus balloon pump and PCI versus impella in high-risk patients, unprotected left main, EF less than 35%, three-vessel disease, so really in, uh, interesting study. 
uh, exactly halfway uh, through the trial now with slightly over 300 patients, so mm -hmm. we should have the answer here uh, pretty quickly. At the same time as this randomized trial is going on, they have put together a registry. I want to share just a couple of things about that because I think it gives a lot of insight into how we use it. So they combined patients, sites where there were more than four patients since June, all patients, of course, they had IRB approval, and uh, 16 sites uh, participated in this. And if you look at the use in these 181 patients, you can see that over 55% are so what I call semi-elected. They're the highest PCI patients. Um, shock um, basically represents a relatively small group, 14%, and acute myocardial infarction is 34%. So it's a relatively mostly elected PCI yeah. patients. And if you look at the patient characteristics here, the average 69, mostly males, you know, all the things you expect. EF is 32% on average, 58% were treated with uh, unprotected left main disease. Syntax score was very high, 39%. This is very high use. And the average pump flow was 2.1 liters and support on average an hour in the uh, procedure. And if you looked at the, the individual characteristics here, you can see 42% uh, were class four heart failure. Uh, uh, the rest were class three, rate basically. And you can see uh, cabbage were declined in 64. In fact, 85% uh, of these, they were declined because of the high morbidity. So it's a very high risk uh, group of patients. This shows the syntax score. The average in the syntax trial mean was 23 in this group of the Pella registry is 39, so it's a very high risk uh, group of patients. And if you looked at compared pre-PCI versus afterwards, they had a very high success rate of treating it. Syntax score uh, fell quite a bit. And if you looked at the outcomes uh, uh, with this, there was an increase in injection fraction um, in this 22 patients where they had a pairwise comparison. Mm -hmm. Still pretty impressive uh, for a small study like this. Right, and I mean, it's a, about a 5% increase, which I think most clinicians would accept as a significant increase in, in ejection fraction. Yes, particularly for elective uh, right. uh, PCI. And MACE rates were all pretty low. I mean, there's never going to be zero in this population, about 3% mortality, 3% right. MI. And if you look at long-term survival, mm -hmm. or 30-day survival, it's 98%. So it's pretty good uh, 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 setup. Absolutely, for a group of patients that was declined for bypass yes. surgery. Yes, yeah. And so if you look at all of these devices, balloon pumps, CPS, tandem heart, and impeller, they all have pros and cons as far as the uh, size of the catheters, the sheets of these inserted, how they improve the hemodynamics uh, shown here at the bottom. So tandem heart and impeller are your two best devices compared to balloon pump. Um, <clears throat> and, but, you know, the problem with the tandem heart is the transeptal. So mm -hmm. there's pros and cons in using these. So my reflections on this in this area is that I think balloon pump is really the first to, uh, first device that you go uh, to in this setting, unless the patient is very, very high risk, in which case Impella would be a reasonable uh, choice. Obviously, the randomized trial will be very important here, and um, that's the part that we just have to learn more about. Magnus, that was a terrific overview, and I think this is obviously a rapidly evolving field. Let me start out by asking you, um, are there situations that, at least in experienced hands, that, that these devices should be used in the acute setting, for example? I mean, um, tandem heart, impella. I mean, the, the experience that, I, that I've seen is that this is a patient, uh, usually that the surgeons have seen, they've turned down, you have time to discuss uh, the risks and benefits with the patient. But it seems that they may have a role in the acute setting as well. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think, I mean, as, as we get better experience of using the Impella device, I think that is going to be the device that in the higher risk cardiogenic shock patients yeah. who, who are either already on a balloon pump and not doing well or where you really understand baseline low EF and they're coming in and now they're having another MI. Mm -hmm. um, I think Impella would really be the a device to use that. But technically to put it in, uh, the one thing that happens a lot when you put this in, which you don't worry so much in elective PCI, is uh, VT or VF. Yeah. Because 
you, you're basically having a, a wire stuck in the LV mm -hmm. to which you thread a catheter over it, which tends to irritate the LV quite a bit. So that's one piece that you just have to keep in mind. And of course, cardiac arrest and shock is just a really bad situation. So I think we have a little bit more to learn about these devices. I think tandem heart, unless you're very specialized and deal with this all the time, I think in QMI that's probably a little bit further on. I think most physicians would just be a little bit nervous doing a transeptal and full anticoagulation mm -hmm. in somebody coming in with cardiac shock. But for a patient with aortic stenosis, it is the device of choice because you have no, you don't have to put, put anything across the LV and you can really support patients with it. So uh, talk a little bit about the learning curve for each of these. I mean, you know, you mentioned that these are, uh, first of all, a lot of these patients are not going to be done uh, by inexperienced operators to begin with. But how steep is the learning curve for some of these devices? I think it's steep enough, I, um, as, you, uh, as you're learning from radio. Mm -hmm. I, I think anything less than 10 cases, you really are, are just still learning. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, putting a number to it is difficult, but I think, you know, we've done uh, close to 30 cases now at Duke, and I still think we're learning a little bit mm -hmm. as we go along. I think we've got a lot better at it, and we're quicker at it. Yeah. Putting the device in the first few times takes time, priming the device and all of that, although the staff in, in the cath lab are really doing a good job. But I think that those are the pieces. And then, actually, there's always some issues, how much you support a patient right. and so on. And I think in the beginning, we put everybody on full support. Now I think we're a little bit more generous, not running everybody on full support. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you the last in the last few minutes here, um, uh, sort of a more policy or, or projection type of questions. You mentioned at the beginning of your talk the collaboration with the surgeons. What do you think are the elements uh, of, a, of a good hemodynamic support program that have to be in place at a hospital before someone embarks on doing these kinds of procedures? Well, I, I think you can do it with minimal team approach, but I think you're better off with a, uh, with a, with a good team. And I think it, uh, surgeons that you can work with and understand what you can do and what they can do. For a, pa for a surgeon to get a patient on an impeller on full support is actually quite nice because they don't have to worry about anything about uh, hemodynamic support in that setting. Um, the other group that I think are important that we work closely with here is the cardiac anesthesiologist. Even though impeller can be put in without them, tandem heart, you probably want them involved because it's, an, a, roller, it's a pump uh, uh, setup. Uh, I still think it's very helpful to have them involved in your team. And then, of course, we're fortunate because we have a transplant cardiology team mm -hmm. who deals with LVADs and other support devices. So I, in the ideal environment, you have all of those key players working together and talking about how you approach patients. The wonderful thing is, five years ago, we had, we had very little choice. Now we have a choice and actually picking the device that works best for the surgeon and the transplant cardiologist is actually a really wonderful experience to have. And final question, where is this technology headed? I mean, do you see it getting smaller, easier to put in, uh, you know, sort of flattening out the learning curve and the, the pieces that need to be in place? Yeah, I see, I see the device is getting smaller for sure. I mean, look at a balloon pump. It started off, uh, uh, when you did your training, it was a, uh, was a nine and a half French, right. yeah. and now it's down to seven. Mm -hmm. So, so it's going to get smaller, and uh, uh, and I'm no doubt that that's going to there's going to be some other innovative ways. I think the next level, which is pretty interesting to me, is the bridging. It, this is not bridging now to surgery, but actually bridging to another device. And I see a lot of openings in how you actually take a patient in shock, you revascular, them, you have them on impeller. Uh, or a balloon pump, you want to transition them to another device and mm -hmm. what that device should be. Because I think ultimately to support a patient for a short period of time, 12, 24, 48 hours, in the big picture is a very short time. But access and vascular complications and all these other things play into it. So mm -hmm. to me, I think that's going to be the exciting part for us uh, to work with a transplant cardiologist and talk about that. So we have a good start, but a lot more work to, to be done. A lot more work. Great. Well, this has been a terrific program. My uh, guest faculty today has been Magnus Oman, one of my colleagues here at Duke. Magnus, thanks again for joining us and for such a great presentation. Thank you, Sunil. It was, was a lot of fun. Until next time, then, from all of us here at Duke, this is Sunil Rao saying thanks for joining us and take care.